Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Oh, to Know Him. God wants us to come to know Him. And He wants to reveal Himself to us. It's the greatest privilege a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, could ever wish for or could ever hope for. I believe that it is, in fact, the greatest or the most important thing of all to know Jesus and to know his ways and then to make him be made known. So to know him and make him be made known is our greatest privilege. You know, many people say things like, my Jesus will never do this, or my Jesus would never do that, or they say things like, my God will never judge me or judge someone for the things that they believe or the things that they do, because love is love. Well, I'm here to tell you that God will indeed judge you for, for the same things that you say that God will not judge you for if they're wrong. God will judge you. I know maybe your God will not judge you, but the God of the Bible will judge you. So you better get to know him and you better get to know his ways, what he wants, what he expects from us. Because we will, each and every one of, uh, one of us will have to give an account to God for the things that we say and the things that we do. Everything it's written in scripture, so you better familiarize yourself with scripture. So with that said, let us turn to our scripture, which is found in Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. So if you want to find favor in God's sight, get to know him. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses is actually complaining to the Lord. And his first statement is a little deceptive to us. It, 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 we don't fully understand what it is that Moses is trying to get at. So let me explain. Moses starts out by beating around the bush, so to speak. He claims that God told him to bring this people up, but he didn't tell him who will go with him. But that is not the real issue for Moses. Why do I say that? Because if we look at the chapter before, chapter uh, Exodus chapter 32, verse 34, it says, But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. 
Behold, my angel shall go before you. Therefore, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. God had already explained or he had already assured Moses that he himself will be going with Moses. He will go with Moses. But let us read the next sentence that comes out of Moses' mouth. Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 and 13. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, and remember, this is Moses that is speaking, right? Please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Now, it starts to become much, much clearer to us. Moses' complaint is, you know me, but I don't really know you, and that ain't fair. I, I want to know you just like you know me. I want to know you, Lord. That is what Moses' complaint is. And that isn't really a complaint as much as it is a request. And a very good request at that because God wants us to know him. And he wants to reveal himself to us. And how do we do that? And that's a very good question. And I'll tell you how. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And Paul uh, echoes that same sentiment in his letter to the Corinthians. And if you take a note, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. So, without doubt, and with our two witnesses, God is saying, you want to boast? Here's something for you to boast about. Boast that you know me and that you understand me, even though I am beyond understanding. Boast that you know me. Now, I want you to, to understand, this is what God is saying. I want you to understand that I, the Lord God, practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. So, if you want to boast, boast about that. That is something for you to boast about. You see, that is a three-strand cord that is not easily broken. God shows us his one, steadfast love, two, his justice, and three, his righteousness. So now Moses has God's attention because this is exactly what God wants to hear. And I cannot say it enough. God wants us to know him. God wants us to understand him. God wants to reveal himself to us. We are his children and he loves us. He wants us near. He wants us to draw near to him that he might draw near to us. But I want you to check this out. Moses was an interceder. He did not just Think about himself and himself alone. He thought about Israel and he asked for them as well. He wanted them to know God as well. I don't know if you caught that or not, but look, let us reread um, verse 13. Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And there it is. 
Consider also that this nation is your people. They need to know you as well. They need to know who you are. They need to understand you. The problem with that is though, is that someone else can't know you for them. You, you, you have to know God for yourself. And sadly, the people of Israel did not ask to know God, nor were they overly keen on the idea. Look, at what the people of Israel's, Israel did. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 through 21. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us. We will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear. God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Did you catch that? The people feared and trembled when they saw and heard the glory of God. In other words, they let ungodly fear overtake them and they stood afar off. Ungodly fear is a predator. It will separate you from God. Just like the lion goes in there and separates the young, separates the weak. The, the fear will go in there and it will separate you from God and it will cause you to stand afar off. But godly fear, godly fear will draw you or will cause you to run to God. So make no mistake though, Moses was afraid as well. But his fear was a godly fear, the kind of fear that God requires us to have. It is called the fear of God. Look at what happened next. It says, then they said, you speak to us, Moses, but do not let God speak, for we will die. People have this ungodly fear of God that if they make just one mistake, God will strike them down. Like God is waiting in heaven, looking intently just for you to make one mistake so that he can kaput you. Or if you go out on a Sunday and you, you, you're gonna get in a car accident and you're gonna die, or you can't do this, or you can't do that without severe consequences. God is not waiting for you to make one wrong move and bam, game over. No, God, it's not like that. That is not the kind of God that God is. That only happens with ungodly fear. The Israelites refuse to hear God for themselves. Thus, they refuse to know him. They wanted Moses to hear for them. They wanted Moses to go and hear God and then come back and tell them and they wanted to miss, listen to Moses. But they did not want to hear God for themselves. The problem with that is that you have to hear God for yourself in order to know him for yourself. And you can only do that by talking with him through prayer, reading the scriptures. It is his revealed word about himself, meditating on God's word and letting him speak to you. That is why the people of Israel's legacy and Moses's legacy were so different. Look at Psalms 103 verse six through eight. It says, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So notice with me that sandwiched right between that three strand cord that we spoke of earlier is verse seven. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. So the people of Israel were only familiar with God's acts. They only saw what he did, 
because they stood afar off. But Moses knew his ways because he drew near to God. Moses said, let me know your works that I might know you. David also knew his God and that is why he's known as the man after God's own heart because he sought to know the Lord, his God. But the people of Moses' day were not so inclined to put themselves out there in order to know God. They stood afar off. It's the same today. People are good and intent or content to come to church, sit in the pews, listen to a sermon, listen to, 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 to the praise and worship, and let someone else praise God for them. They sit quietly by while their neighbors get more and more undignified. But catch them at a football game. They will come home with their throats sore, their, their, their voices hoarse from the screaming and the yelling and the celebrating. Those people will never see God's glory until they catch the spirit of Moses. Look at Moses' heart's desire. Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 through 23. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my faith for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Please show me your glory. That is Moses' plea to God. Please, Lord, show me your glory. Now, please understand that God was already sitting down with Moses and talking to him face to face like a friend talked to his friend face to face. But Moses wanted more. God is, is, is like, good, good. I like this. I want you to want more. I want you to know more. I want to show you who I am, but I can't show you everything because I am too glorious and you will die, Moses. So God granted Moses his request and he placed him in the cleft of the rock and then he caused all his goodness to pass by Moses. Look with me, please, at Exodus chapter 34, verse six and seven. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Aren't we glad? Aren't you glad? I know I'm so glad that his steadfast love and his faithfulness is constantly around us. It's constantly protecting us. What would we do if God was to one day wake up on the wrong side of the bed, so to speak? We would all be in trouble. But as it is, God is patient and kind and his righteous, righteousness dwells all around us. He, he's kind and, uh, and generous to wicked as well as the saints. But he will by no means acquit the guilty. Did you notice that as well? He will by no means acquit the guilty. You will give an account for the things 
that you have done. So even though God is merciful, even though God is gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, he still punishes the guilty and does not just let them go free. Because God is a God of justice. So don't let anyone tell you that you can live any way that you choose. You can do whatever you want. Whatever you choose is going to be okay with God. Because their God will not send you to hell. But the God of the Bible, you will have to give an account to him for every word and every action. So to put it in the words of the greatest evangelist, that super apostle, St. Paul, he wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 through 34. He said, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. And therein lies the problem. People who say such things do not know the true God. They think that they know God, but to their own shame, they do not. Because everyone will be called to an account. God blesses the righteous as well as the wicked. Yes, that is true. He will let both the moral and the immoral dwell together until the time of the judgment. And then he will separate one from the other. He will place the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. You know, there's a story about Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest theologians and philosophers of the British American Puritanism. And he was the bringer of the Great Awakening. It is said that he had a daughter with an ungovernable temper. But as is so often the case, the infirmity was not known to the outside world. A worthy young man fell in love with his daughter, and he sought her hand in marriage. You can't have her, was the abrupt answer of Jonathan Edwards. But I love her, the young man replied. You can't have her, said Jonathan Edwards. But she loves me, replied the young man. Again, Edwards said, you cannot have her. Why, said the young man. Because she's not worthy of you. But, he asked, is she not a Christian? Yes, she is a Christian. But the grace of God can live with some people with whom no one else could ever live. And that, my friends, that is the grace that I am talking about. The grace that can live with some people with whom no one else can live. We desire that grace. We need that grace. Even if we don't realize it, we need that grace. But the problem is that grace will not last forever. It will not get you through the judgment if you do not get right with God. You have to come to God in submission. You have to confess your sins and you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to accept him as, as your propitiation for your sins. Hit the sacrifice, the blood that taketh away all sin. For as I said, where would we be without that grace? That grace that is that's lavished upon us. The grace and mercy of Almighty God. And thank God that we do have that grace. Thank God that his grace brought us through and will continue to see us through until his great return that, that us Christians are waiting and longing for. But again, I say to you, if you do not know Jesus as your own personal Savior for yourself, if you don't know him, if you don't know his grace, if you don't personally accepted Jesus, that grace, that mercy will be taken away 
at the judgment because God wants you to know him and he wants to reveal himself to you. But you have to want it. He will not just force it on you. You have to want it and he will freely give it. And now, now is the opportunity. Today is the day of salvation because tomorrow is promised to no, no man. So my friends, do you know Jesus? Do you know his mercies for your own self? Have you experienced his grace for yourself? If you haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, do not let another day go by. His return is imminent. His return is right soon. It's, it's at hand. So accept them before it's too late. As I said, today's the day of salvation. Make Jesus your choice. And if you would like to make Jesus your choice, if you would like to know him as your Lord and Savior, all you have to do is to ask. How do you ask? Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood, for dying on Calvary, that I might live. I want to know you. I want to know your ways. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lead me with your grace and your mercy now. I accept it. I accept you as my Lord, as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible and get a highlighter. Read your Bible and highlight those verses, those promises. Learn them. Commit them to memory. Commit them to your heart. Find a Bible. Believe in church. Not one of those progressive churches that tell you you can live any way you want. Anything you want to do, you can do. That is a lie. You cannot. You have to live according to God's standards. You have to have love in your heart, forgiveness. So join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.